Hi class, in this recording we are going to focus on how we move things through the intestinal tract. One of the key things that we do in our intestinal tract is we have segmentation. And segmentation is going to depend upon both the circular muscle and the longitudinal muscle within the muscularis externus. And as we look at the segmentation process, we find that we have the circular muscle pinching off at segments within the intestines, and then the longitudinal muscle can contract and move something along and squirt it through a pinched off segment, and then new areas of circular muscle can contract. And as we alternate between circular muscle contracting and longitudinal muscle contracting, we find that we have a lot of mixing within the intestinal tracts. This is the most common kind of intestinal contraction that occurs. And to regulate this, we have enteric pacemaker cells. So when we say enteric, think intestinal. When we think of pacemaker cells, think of neurons that are going to spontaneously depolarize at a set rate. So these enteric pacemaker cells set the rhythm of segmentation within the muscularis externa of the intestinal walls. Even if we've absorbed all the all or most of the nutrients from the chyme, we're still going to have some leftover residue. And this leftover residue needs to push through. And as we start pushing it through, we shift from segmentation more towards peristalsis. And this segmentation process is going to focus primarily on mixing, whereas peristalsis focuses exclusively on the movement of the molecules. So as we look at peristalsis, peristalsis is going to have waves of contraction pushing food matter towards the large intestine and then finally towards the, the rectum and then out of the body. There's a, a hormone called motilin. This is the first time we've mentioned this hormone. Hormone is a or excuse me, motilin is a hormone that is going to start peristaltic waves within the duodenum. And that individual peristaltic wave travels about 10 to 70 centimeters before it dies out. And then we'll have another peristaltic wave farther down the digestive tract. So we have one wave followed by another wave followed by another wave. And these overlapping peristaltic waves can be referred to as migrating motor complexes. And as they work, they're going to squeeze the chyme or milk the chyme over to the colon um, over a period of about two hours. And then we can start processing the chyme to make feces. Um, a lot of times students will ask me, hey, how long does food stay in the intestinal tract? And that's a good, you know, that's a good question. And there's a lot of things that can influence that. Um, I know it can go all the way through your intestinal tract as quickly as 12 hours. And I know that because of an impromptu experiment I did once with my uh, oldest child. When he was oh, about six months old, my wife and I gave him a bunch of ground up beets, beet puree for dinner. And he loved it. He ate a ton of bright red beets for dinner. And then the next day at daycare, about 12 hours later, I got a very panicked phone call from my daycare provider because she thought my oldest son had bloody stool. When she changed his diaper, 12 hours, his diaper, 12 hours later, those bright red beets that we fed my son had worked their way all the way through and scared the living daylights out of my daycare provider. And I remember thinking, huh, 12 hours. That's how long it took to go through. Now, at the very end of the small intestine, we have the ilium. And at that ilium, we have a sphincter-like muscle with a flap of tissue that work together to make the ileocecal valve. And that ileocecal valve is almost always going to be closed to keep fecal matter from going backwards into the small intestine. However, if we have food in our stomach, that's going to trigger what is known as the gastroileal reflex. And that's going to maximize or upregulate segmentation within the ileum and relax the valve so that we start pushing food into the colon. And as the food is pushed into the colon, this first part of the colon is referred to as the cecum. And as the cecum is filling with food, eventually it's going to have some back pressure. And the back pressure is going to force the ileocecal valve shut. Well, we have this figure up on the screen. It's also worth emphasizing that we as humans have an appendix 
Our appendix is a small projection that extends inferiorly from the cecum and is about the size of our pinky. That's all we have for this discussion on intestinal motility. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to post them in the class discussion board or to shoot me an email. And as always, happy studies.